a strange thing happened this July. Everyone was glued to their TV, everyone was watching, your aunt was watching, your neighbor was watching, your dog was watching. And the surprising thing was they were watching women's soccer, which a lot of people in the business world would have written off in terms of its commercial prospects, certainly at that scale. This past year for this World Cup final, 20 million plus people tuned in, breaking records for soccer of any gender. Now compare that to 1999, about 13 million people watched. So something big has changed. Mm -hmm. And these people on stage are at the heart of why. So I want to start out by, by asking about that. Uh, what was it like, I'll start with you, Alex, mm -hmm. essentially being a part of the moment where women's soccer became commercial, certainly to this extent, for the first time? What contributed to that? You know, we saw some of that with the 2012 Olympics, and I think usually with a four-year cycle being World Cup Olympics and then a couple off years, you have a little bit of a drop-off for, um, for our sport at least, just not being in the mainstream um, news all the time. So for us, it wasn't that much of a drop-off, so we knew this was going to be huge, and obviously not winning a World Cup for 16 years and having a World Cup only come around every four years, we knew that this was our chance um, to just prove ourselves and just have the whole country rally behind us. So we got a glimpse of that during the World Cup, but we were in our own little bubble um, for that month that we really didn't realize the impact that we had on the nation until we got home, until you guys saw with the LA rally, which they got together in 24 hours, with the New York City ticker tape parade that they got together in three days, um, which had, they have never honored a women's sports team. And the last female athlete they honored was in the 60s for a ticker tape parade. So that was pretty amazing. And so I think we started to realize it after the World Cup during. We honestly didn't, we didn't see it. Huge effect on the country and huge effect on the sport. Yeah. But there are some ways in which, and we were talking about this backstage, not enough has changed. One of those is just gender equality in terms of how much money is in this sport. Interesting fact, the pay cap for the women's major league soccer players is 11 times less than the pay cap for men's major league soccer. 11 times. What has to change, Alex? A lot. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think just continuing to, um, you, you see that we captured a nation this summer. So seeing the fact that we, it is exciting stuff to watch on, on TV. It's, we're putting good product out there and we're, I play for a club team in Portland and we average around 14,000 fans a game, which is pretty crazy for women's soccer. So to see that, it's just, I think the players need to get paid, um, you know, for what, the, for what they're worth, for what they put out on the field. And I think it's going to take time because obviously the MLS, they're in their 20th season now. And for us, we just finished our third, third season. So it's going to take time, but I think we're headed in the right direction. And I also think it starts with FIFA because what they, the, the regulations and everything that they implement affect us, um, affect all of us. And I, I think also for them, it's continuing to help those federations that don't have as much equal opportunity on the women's side, like a lot of the African nat um, nations that culturally, they don't really see women as, as athletes. So giving the opportunity to young girls and creating kind of this global platform for, for females to be able to play sports, it kind of starts with FIFA saying, this is, this is how it is, and, and also putting females on the executive committee. Um, it, it's just going to take a lot of people to come together, and it's going to take time, but I think we're headed in the right direction. Julie, if FIFA wanted to, could they fix that gender gap or at least help it more than they are? Um, I absolutely think you can fix it. I mean, I think over time we're trying to definitely do our part as a team and having the platform of us winning and, and continuing to even grow it in our in our country, I think it's important for us to, to continue in and really push FIFA to be better than what they've been doing. And Shannon, what about the other side of that argument? I mean, there are those probably within FIFA who would say, hey, look, this is supply and demand. The bigger contracts are on the men's side because it's a bigger sport. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. It's, it's, it's bigger in the U.S. I think that the U.S. looks at the women's team and, and, and sticks behind it, but you're seeing these other countries where maybe that's not as, as well. Um, but we still have so much to grow even in the U.S. And so, yeah, on the other side, you can say, okay, well, the men are bringing in a lot of money, and for the national team, we bring in that money for 
every four years or every time there's an Olympics or a World Cup, and now we have to find a way to do that. But we are, we're starting to find a way, and that's, I think, what Alex was talking about, is that we are gaining ground. Um, you look at social media, you look at how many people are following Alex, you're, you know, that's the start of it. And I think social media has really helped um, grow the women's game as well, because now we're, we're being noticed and we're being followed constantly through those gapped years. And I think that's what's going to help, is to continually have us in the market and have us on, on TV and have us in the news, because that's what's going to continue to help us grow. Yeah, and going off of that, I mean, I, I just want to say, during the World Cup, I feel like, uh, at least for my family, they couldn't even find merchandise for stuff, because I, I, I don't know if it was really Canada or FIFA that didn't prepare for the volume of people to come watch us play, but... All of, most of our games were sold out. There were a lot of fans coming up for the games, flying in, wanting to buy Women's World Cup stuff. And there was like a two-hour line during the entire game. And, and so you can say, yeah, I mean, uh, the men's teams bring in a lot more marketing dollars and bring in just a lot more money for FIFA. But at the same time, they need to at least prepare for us to mm -hmm. take that next step. They need to be ahead of the game and kind of help us continue to edge on. Shannon mentioned the huge profile they now have, each of you. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Julia, about the pressure to be a role model? How have you responded to that? I don't really think pressure is the right word. I think, um, I think in the limelight that we're in that it's important for us. And being one of the younger players um, on the team, that's definitely, I think, what the older players have um, kind of platform for us to be like, you know, I think it's definitely important and we want to grow the game. And at one point um, I was watching Shannon when she was playing and um, that's aged me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think Little ageism it, happening on stage, <laughs> but no, those are the raw moral models that I had and they allowed us to learn it and has allowed me to succeed in, in something that I love that she loves as well as soccer has been a platform for us. And that's what we take upon us. Like it's, it's definitely a goal for us to be those role models and continue to have them dream like we dreamed when, when we were younger. Shannon, how do you respond to being called a role model? Oh, I mean, it's great. That's, that's what this whole, this whole thing is about. And um, I've been on the team for 12 years. And to see these young players come up and, and how talented they are. But then there's more to just being great on the field. It's how you conduct yourself on and off the field and be a leader on and off the field. And, and you know we are growing the game, so we always have to remember that, that it's not just about how we play, it's about how we handle ourselves. And a lot of it is young girls, and now we're starting to realize we can reach out to more than just young girls. We can reach out to grown men and, and families and different things like that. So um, it's very cool to be a role model, to know that they look up to me um, on and off the field, and I think that it's something that I value as well. 12 years, you said, and you recently retired, right? I'm going to, yeah. My last game will be... Can we, uh, can we give a hand to <laughs> Shannon? More than a decade in the sport and an incredible way to go out on top. Thank you. Really exciting. And Alex, what about you? What does being a role model mean to you? I mean, it's huge. I just think about when I was eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. And when I was 10 was the 99 World Cup. And um, I was watching these women on TV just kick ass. And they were honestly, um, they were probably one of the first female sports teams that I saw on TV on a, on a regular channel. So for me, that was very new. That was very cool. And I wanted to kind of follow in their footsteps. So I feel like having that opportunity for young girls now having us on TV a lot more often. Um, I just did a soccer clinic in Jersey last night, um, just kind of reaching out into our communities and kind of showing them kind of the way that we took and how, you know, they're a, a lot of times we talk about um, living your dreams and um, that sort of thing, because that's what it was for us when we were younger. It was a dream and it was it was a hard thing to, it was very hard to get here. You had to sacrifice a lot. You had to um, face gender inequalities um, on, you know, in the sports side and um, in every other part of life a lot of times. But it's, it's really, for me, it's reaching out into my community and making sure that um, I show young girls that their dreams are alive if that's what they want to do, become a professional soccer player, professional athlete, um, that it's alive and well, and we're um, succeeding at that and helping edge on women's sports um, globally as well. Alex mentioned reaching out to girls 
in your communities, but also around the world with the reach you have. When you see, Shannon, the millions of girls who are not in school, for instance, mm -hmm. how do you respond to that? And, and as female role models, do, do each of you have a responsibility to speak up on that? I think 100% we do. Um, being kind of an elite athlete, we have a voice that people are wanting to listen to. Um, they want to, we have a visibility, we have an, a reach that we can get to a lot more people um, with our Twitters and Instagrams and all of those things. And I think it's a big responsibility that we have. I'm a new mother, I'm a new mother so uh, education, thank you, is, is one thing that now is even more to the front of my mind, you know, of all these young kids that don't have a chance to go to pre-K and they're already starting behind when they hit kindergarten. And to know that that's already something to set them back for the rest of their life. They're already seeing facts that by starting, no, stop, not starting pre-K, you're already behind when you're 20 years old. So these are huge factors that I think, even though we're athletes, we all still have those life lessons that we've had to go through, and we have a big role with using our voice to try to help them. Alex, you were the first women's soccer player, I think actually soccer player of any gender, to pass a million followers on Twitter? Well, I'm pretty sure Messi or Ronaldo <laughs> passed a million before me, but maybe Look, we can't, we can't mess with Cristiano. Maybe However, US, American, American. <laughs> um, what is that like, being a, a social athletic star, which is a new phenomenon? Well, a lot of people definitely take everything I say and correct me <laughs> grammatically. <laughs> and um, definitely, I have a lot Twitter more. Twitter loves to correct grammar. And they always do it with grammatical errors. Have you noticed that? They tweet at you saying, you're wrong, and they do your wrong. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it's definitely interesting um, to kind of see um, see women's soccer just continue to rise. And then for myself, just having social media platforms to be able to tell people a little about who I am and share with people the upcoming games we have because sometimes they aren't on TV. So um, I, I think that social media really took off, started to take off in 2011 for the World Cup. I started with, I want to say I started with 30,000 fans and I got 500,000 on Twitter by the end of 2011 World Cup. And I was, I doubled my followers on Instagram through this World Cup. So it's, it's a little weird to have so many eyes on me and um, kind of think about that before I post anything, knowing that it's, <laughs> you're never able to erase that. <laughs> but it's, um, it's fun. I mean, any attention to bring to the sport in a positive way is, is good. Guys, celebrities, they're just like us. They do it all for the follows as well. <laughs> J Julie, is that an unalloyed good is there a downside to it being such a, a social business now, sports? I don't necessarily think it's, it's a downside. Um, I, I think when it just, it's bigger than the sport. You know, we, we, we play soccer and we love it, but we also um, know that I think it comes with other responsibilities. And that's to grow the sport, it's to be good role models, it's to do this and reaching out to, with media, with social um, apps or, or whatever it is, it, it's just part of it. And if you take it in a positive light, I think anything that'll come out of it will be positive. What has the hardest part been for each of you of this meteoric rise to fame? <laughs> Shannon? <laughs> Well, I come from the old school, so I have, just to get me on Twitter, I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so, <laughs> um, but no, I, I think, you know, I think the hardest part is that you have to watch everything you do, and, and it, it's, it's not natural to do that, you know, and I think, um, but we obviously want that, we, we take responsibility for it choosing to play the sport that we do and at the level that we do it, but it, I think sometimes you, you definitely have to think about, like, I can't just go do this. I have to actually think about our kids going to be here. Or that, you know, and not that we're doing anything terrible, but you know, you just always on your mind of, I have to be on. I think you're doing all right in the role <laughs> model department. Alex, what's the hardest part been for you? Just in general, or? This entire, this, this past three month period where things have, I'm sure, changed so much in each of your lives. I think, well, for me at least, I, I, I think when I'm in my soccer clothes um, and on the soccer field, I know 
the fact that I know that I have so many eyes on me, but at home, I guess I want to just be myself and I want to go to dinner with my husband without being interrupted here or there. So I, I feel like I'm a little more shy and personal about my life when I'm outside of the soccer world. Um, I guess I take, I take it on in two different ways. So for me, it's when um, I'm kind of recognized or when people, when, you, when one person recognizes you and then other people start to recognize you, I guess I kind of get like a little embarrassed and shy and I just want to cave up and like just go back home and I don't really want to go outside sometimes because I feel like going to dinner or whatever it is, you're going to, I don't want to say bothered, but you're going to just, you're going to be interrupted in dinner or whatever you're doing and sometimes I don't always want to take a picture or I don't always want to put on, you know, a happy face or show face. So I think that for me is something a little new, just always kind of being a little courteous. And if you're rude, it's that one person. If you're rude to someone or say no to someone, that one person is gonna make sure that it's known on Twitter or whatever it is. So it's gonna get back to you eventually. And so I see that a lot of times you can't make everyone happy, but I know on the soccer field, you're, you're gonna, we have to sign autographs, we have to take pictures. And I wanna do that for the little girls, but um, sometimes for those autograph poachers, um, I don't always want to sign autographs and, and they will make it known that you are being rude and they will make it known that you're not being a nice person and sometimes I don't really care. <laughs> good, good. Screw the <laughs> autograph poachers. Although look, they're making a living too. Yes. Moral of the story, I think, get famous, tip well, probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah, that's a good one. A so, so. Obviously, the sport has been in the headlines in not such a great way in recent months with the FIFA corruption scandal. How has that affected all of you, Shannon? Well, um, <laughs> um, you know, I think we've always, I mean, FIFA is obviously a, our governing body, but it, it yeah, that's a tough one. But um, <gasps> It's funny, we were talking about this in the, in the green room. And their lovely PR representative, hi, was like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Talk about FIFA. <laughs> you know, I, I, They've been clear. I mean, we've, we've yeah. struggled with them, I think, just on the whole equality piece. And I think that it would be great if FIFA kind of went more to the women's side. Because I think, you know, you look at it with, our, with the World Cup being on artificial turf. I don't think the men would have played on artificial turf. And well, Didier, Didier Drogba, who just signed with the MLS he won't in Montreal. He actually, my husband plays for Orlando. They came down and played in Orlando and he, like, he refused to play. Mm -hmm. He's 37 years old and has never played on turf in his life. But they had the Women's World Cup on turf. So you guys are all familiar with this, right? Big scandal during this last World Cup. I'm seeing a few shaking heads. So tell me if I get any of this wrong, but they, over the opposition of many players, uh, did this last World Cup final for women for the first time entirely on artificial turf. Mm -hmm. Even though there were companies that were volunteering to install the grass that would have been necessary. For free. Yeah, for free. free. So this was a big controversy and there was a feeling that they wouldn't have done that in a male World Cup. Do you guys agree with that? 100%. Yeah. yeah. There's no question There's about no that. I mean, and they no, wouldn't have played. Yeah. You know, and that's... They I wouldn't think, have played. Yeah. I think they bring in some... I mean, they bring in millions if not more, marketing dollars. So we get it on the men's side. They have more leverage, but it's still not okay. Right. And for people who are just becoming acquainted with this issue, how does it make the sport different when you're playing on turf? Well, one, it's an, it's an injury. Um, we've seen it time and time again that more injuries have happened on turf, and, and that's just a fact. And the game is different. I mean, it's just the way it is. And... Um, you can't really change anything about that. I mean, we played on it, and, and you know, you, that's just what happens. So in addition to the turf issues, when we talk about the corruption we've seen within FIFA, if we now know that FIFA representatives were potentially getting a cut of some of these contracts, and there was this incentive to go for the biggest contracts, and the biggest contracts are on the male side of the equation. Do you think that the corruption within FIFA adversely affected women more as a result of that, Alex? I'm not sure. You know, I, I think that, honestly, the women's side is, a, it's a second thought for them. So, yeah, I think in a way, 
whatever, um, you know, however they can continue to be a billion dollar nonprofit, then, then so be it um, where they reside in Switzerland. But I think it changes are being made, obviously. Sepp Blatter has stepped down. A lot of, um, a lot of ex FIFA executives, I think, have, um, have been charged with um, money laundering and a lot of th those sorts of things. So there's obviously corruption involved. Um, how much it adversely affects us, I can't say. But I guess in the next five, 10 years, we'll know. If I encounter a mysterious accident on the way out of this panel, it is probably the FIFA <laughs> assassins that have been sicked on me after this conversation. No, they're staying far away from the US, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got to now. Yeah. yeah. So Julie, you were actually initially left off the US roster. How did that affect your psychology when you made it onto the field, that you were a last minute addition? Yeah, um, well we had qualifying and I think, well, <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, because I think a lot of people relate to that. Uh, no, totally. They get an opportunity, and they have in the back of their mind, you know, I wasn't the first person to to walk into this role. Right. And well, you have to not let that psych you out, and clearly you didn't. Yeah. Well, it kind of was a blessing in disguise. You know, I think um, it kind of was an eye-opening experience that I that I absolutely needed to see where I wanted to go and. Um, you know, what, what my goals were, and I had to kind of reevaluate myself and where I wanted to be. And, you know, I, I kind of found out that um, when failure meets um, opportunity, you have another opportunity to actually succeed. So I didn't make the initial team at first, but it gave me a new opportunity to kind of create what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be as an athlete. And um, as that kind of happened, I, I learned more a lot about myself and, um, started believing in the confidence in myself to, you know, kind of taking that step of where I wanted to go and um, what I could give to the team. And, um, yeah, it, w it was a lot of kind of self-realizing kind of who I wanted to be. And, um, yeah, I was lost at times, and, and it was really, really hard, but I wouldn't change anything for being here and being World Cup champions next to these two. But saying that with her, too, is just, I mean, watching her grow. Um, I played with her in Chicago as well the year before. And, um, you know, Julie took advantage of her opportunity as well. I mean, she did get that second opportunity. And, and when it came and she started in Portugal uh, for our Algarve Cup, um, she took control of that. And she controlled what she could control. And that was working hard off the field, getting prepared. It's really, really hard to break into this team. And she took advantage of any little opportunity because you might not get a big one, and she took it, and it was great. That's something to be proud of. And, and again, I think whatever your walk of life, so often you walk into a situation as an underdog of sorts, and it's about what you do with those opportunities. And be prepared. I find it inspiring. And you, Shannon, have also faced a lot of adversity. Uh, one of the ways in which you've surmounted adversity is Shannon actually has struggled with not one, but two major autoimmune disorders. Right. What has that been like, and how has that changed you as an athlete? Um, yeah, I was diagnosed in uh, 2002 with Sjogren's, and then 2007 with uh, lupus, which obviously for me, it, it uh, affects my joints, and then I have flares of extreme fatigue where I can't get out of bed or those moments. And um, when it first hit, um, it was hard because I was trying to still figure out what I had and trying to get through practices and trying not to let anybody know. Um, and when I had Sjogren's, I actually mentioned it to a coach. And I, it could have been something completely different, but I went from playing 90 minutes to playing maybe five minutes. And I think, you know, in my brain, in my head, that it was because I told him what I had and they couldn't predict when I would have a bad day. Um, so from that moment on, I kept it very hidden uh, and went through the next oof, so many years uh, with lupus and with that of just kind of dealing with it on my own and somehow getting through some trainings, um, uh, not feeling that great. But, you know, it, as an athlete, it kind of reinvented me a little bit. Um, I figured out how to deal with it with my body. I changed my workouts. I changed my eating habits. I think it actually made me a better soccer player just because I had to really focus on what I was doing on those certain days. And, and to be honest, once I actually spoke about it and spoke out, um, 
it even became better because my teammates now knew what I had. They could support me and tell me about support. that decision. How hard was it to open up to your fellow teammates? It became really easy by the time it happened. I think I'd kept it hidden for so long that I really needed the support of my teammates. And we become a family on this team, and I really needed their help to kind of push through the last couple of years that I wanted to play. And um, to be honest, again, having a voice. You know, we have a voice that a lot of other people don't have, and I have so many people that come up to me um, all the time to say, you know, you just inspire me just to go for a walk or go for a run because I have lupus, but I see what you're doing out on the field, and it inspires me to do just a little bit. So, um, but having my teammates support me, they've asked so many questions, you know, now about it, and lupus is a very, um, it's a disease that a lot of people don't know about. So having the support's been amazing. It's kind of pushed me through that last step. You're also a mom, which is something we, we don't hear about a lot in professional sports. What do you hope your legacy teaches the next generation? Perseverance, hard work, um, nothing's going to be handed to you. Um, those are the legacies that I have. I've always been that type of player um, in person, and I hope my daughter can, can learn those things from me, um, but also just her being around all of these girls. I know she might not remember it now, but I can tell her every single person has a different story of how they made it to the top, and none of it was easy, and none of it was handed to each person. So it's kind of what I hope, you know, these people, the kids that have dreams, they got to work hard for them. They don't just come handed to them. Alex, you've become something of a global branding juggernaut. You have huge endorsements with big kind of Coca-Cola, Nike, I think. What is the biggest pitfall of being the face of so many massive corporations? I think just being authentic um, is very important for me. And I've learned the last six years that I've been on the national team um, signing with um, some major companies, global brand companies, that I do want to be the you know face of some companies that I actually use their product or I actually promote healthy living. And so for for some of these, um, like Coca Cola, like Nike, I've been with them. They were two of my first sponsors, um, and it, it's important for me to now growing into myself and feeling like I'm able to make those choices now because I have a lot more opportunity and I, um, I feel like I have grown into who I am and felt a lot more comfortable with who I am. Moving forward, I know that I'm um, being authentic in terms of the way that I'm representing the brand and um, I feel like maybe five years ago or so I was just kind of going along with what people had, the commercials or the photo shoots or the ideas that they would come up to me with um, in terms of how they wanted to use me with the brand and endorsing the product. I didn't really know anything else. So for me now, having that experience, it's wanting to show people who I am with, with the brand that I'm representing. I think that's something that was hard for me before is just not really knowing and I guess it's I could have definitely reached out to my teammates like Abby um, I, like Mia but I think there's there's something that you just need to learn on your own and so that's something I feel a lot more comfortable and with. you're also the author of a series of children's books and now I know this is a millennial focused conference so I had to look it up the term is book and they print them on paper and there are like there are <laughs> words in there I, I've never seen one personally yeah, but me what drew you to children's books. And, and in general, how do you see your role in terms of reaching out to the next generation? You're young yourself. Yeah, so I have a kids book series. Um, there's actually six books in the series. It's called The Kicks, and I actually just um, also published my memoir, which is called Breakaway. And that just talks about my entire life and kind of leading up to the World Cup, um, and it kind of finishes off right before the World Cup. But I was introduced to the idea actually after the Olympics in 2012. And when I thought about it, I was thinking, you know, I think the moment that girls 
kind of make that decision and have that passion in sports or whatever they are is kind of around that eight to 12 time for, is that eight to 12 age. And that's what these books um, are garnered towards those ages. And I feel like when I was 10, 11 years old, it was, I'm playing professional soccer. I'm gonna be on the national team and that's the end of it. Because I feel like for a lot of girls, I saw so many great soccer players, but they have the talent, but they just didn't love it that much. So for me, I think like that 10 year old is, is when you see that shift in, um, oh, this is fun to, this is what I wanna do and nothing's gonna stop me. So for me, I wanted to kind of reach out to them and um, put, these, put this book series out there uh, because there wasn't really a lot for, for young girls um, to, to read athletic books based on females, based on female athletes and especially in the sport of soccer. And not only am I seeing young girls reading it, but young boys are reading it as well. And it's just, it draws from my experience of a girl's soccer team from when I was younger. It's about a girl's soccer team and um, through middle school and dealing with academics, <coughs> boys, soccer fields in terms of gender inequalities and not So basically everything you deal with everything at a professional you athletic yes. level. So it's very relatable and, um, and I, it's, it's been great, and so many girls, every time I go to soccer practice or a game and we have fans, they all have the books out and they love them, and so it's, it's cool because I draw not only my experience, but some of my teammates as well. All right, so as we part ways here, we've talked a lot about mentorship. In one or two sentences, each of you, what is the thing that you wish you had known going into this? If you could, if you could talk to yourself before the World Cup craze this past year, what would you say, Julie? Um, I think what I learned personally is definitely embrace the opportunity and enjoy the journey. I think um, I just needed to have, understand what I was going through and I needed to believe in myself and take a step back. So I definitely would go with embrace the opportunity. Shannon? Um, I would say, um, yeah, just not to forget, you know, what got me here. Um, enjoy the moment. And, you know, more than just on the soccer field, but remember the people that I'm doing this with. Alex, if you could tell your past self one thing, what would it be? Well, I set a lot of goals for myself um, usually, and especially more recently with this World Cup, I would just say that even though you're striving for perfection, you're striving for the best, um, having those, you know, bumps along the road and having that imperfectness at the end is kind of your perfect and making that journey along the way is more important than the end result. And I think just focusing on the end result, you get caught up in so many things. So like they said as well, just enjoying the journey, taking a second and realizing um, where you've come and how much you've done and um, the success that you have created, even though um, you might not have reached your goals yet. I think that's something that we can all take to heart I want to thank you guys for being such an incredible audience. Let's give a hand to these athletes on stage.